Oh, oh. Hey, guys, on the phone. I'm sorry. I, um, uh, you all live on the phone. I thought you folks, huh? Okay. All right. Well, so, we're just getting started. Um, this is really a very, very important meeting. Uh, and the truth of the matter is the answers are in this room. The experts are in the room. Um, to help us solve this problem. And I want to thank a few people. Um, Reed Kennedy Lazat, right here. Um, Mary Sowers, we appreciate you very much coming here and helping us. Uh, Jan Pierce, here you are. Uh, uh, Kim Quinn, where's Kim? There's Kim, she's from ACA. Uh, and Teresa Skidmore and Charlene Henry. Where are they? Right here. Thank you. Thank you. They're from Clarion. So we thank all the experts that have come, but quite frankly, every single person in this room is an expert, uh, and we appreciate it very much. This uh, redesign is extremely important for the future of the people we serve because employment is really just needed. Well, I mean, uh, how many self-advocates do you have in the room? We've got a couple. That's great. So great. Well, listen, I'm going to not take any more time because I know we had to take 15 minutes because of the technical difficulties here, and I'm going to turn it over to Salima, who, um, by the way, we stole from Aka, and I'm really, really glad we did because she is absolutely a star in our organization, and I thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to take an extra second and welcome everyone here. Um, we have invited people who are national and state level content experts to come in and help us to get the change that we need to do in Florida started. But at the end of the day, none of that matters without the rest of you in the room because I've been part of projects where we had all this, what we thought was brain power in the room, coming up with great things, and it fizzled because the people who it affected and the people who had to implement were not on board. So with this process, in the middle of all of our talking, I was like, we have to make sure the people who are going to receive services and deliver services are at the table helping us to design what we're trying to do because you're going to hear conversations about the train has already left the station and you guys especially you who've made the pilgrimage to come to Tallahassee some of you didn't have to make a long drive but um, and for those of you who are spending the day with us on the webinar um, we're going to need your input to make this successful um, without you it, it can fizzle, but the train has left the station, and you being here and being on the phone gives you the ticket to board the train. So one of the things when we have presentations like this, we always want to know who our audience is, who, who are we talking to so that we ensure that the message we deliver is not really just noise. So I want to take a few minutes to just sort of figure out who all is here today. So I know the director suggested there were a couple self-advocates. Do we have any more self-advocates in the room? And if you can just humor me and raise your hand in this process so I can see where you, where you are. Okay. Thanks for being here. Um, what about family members, guardians, or guardian advocates? Do we have anyone representing that group? Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, what about advocacy groups? Great. All right. Yes. Um, what about providers? And for providers, we have all different types of providers. We have, you know, what, what a small provider does is going to be very different from a large provider. So I want to just sort of break down the types of providers we have. Do we have any rural providers in the room? Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Urban providers? What about small providers? 
Um, yeah, smaller agency or or some of the, the smaller. Um, if you think you're small, you yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's the small providers that, that really sort of put the wheels on the bus sometimes. So, um, yeah. And, and sometimes you're actually driving the bus. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, and the larger providers in the room? Okay. Um, what about contractors? We know we have Claren in the room, and um, most of you guys, at least the providers, are aware of who they are. So thanks for being here. And state agency representatives. All right. Um, is there anyone who I didn't call out your group and you didn't have an opportunity to raise your hand? So everyone's been represented. All right. So this room is diverse. And just like the changes that we're going to have to make, um, we're going to need diverse opinions and diverse input. We're going to need the, the opinion of the self-advocates because they're the ones who are going to benefit from the services. And um, so the changes we need to make are going to take everyone who raised their hands and who are represented in this room and on the webinar to make them successful. So we'll talk about the changes that have already taken place, some of the national rules that have caused the train to already leave the station. We'll talk about the fact that the train has left the station. But I want you in the room and on the phone to know that you have your ticket because you're on the train today. This is part of the train leaving the station. So welcome again, and I look forward to your input today. Oh, a little housekeeping. For those of you who haven't been here, the bathrooms, you go out to the right for the ladies' bathroom, and it's the second door on the left, and the men's bathroom, you take a left. And the water fountains are over near the men's bathroom. So anything else? Any other housekeeping items? Okay. And I'd like to ask if you guys could put your cell phones on either vibrate and just check them during breaks. And if you have to leave, just, you know, you can leave out quietly. And we have a few more copies of the presentation up front. If you need it, you can raise your hand. Thank you, Kalima. I'm going to start us out. Um, as I said um, earlier, my name is Ree Kennedy Lazat, and I come from the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services. And Mary Sowers and I are here on contract um, through a CMS project that funds um, resources for states to work through the transition of the home and community-based service system and all the transformation we're doing. That's a very brief, high-level overview. We'll talk about that more. Um, but today, quicker, um, really, um, we're going to take you through a bit of a history lesson um, because uh, and some of you probably have heard more than one presentation about this, but we want to remind you that um, what you're going through here in Florida is something every state in the country is going through, um, and there are some very serious federal legislation that's driving this, that we are taking our system to the next place. Um, nothing in the past, um, do we want to say, happened wrong. Um, we built this system, home and community-based system, over time with all good intent. Um, and this is about just taking it to the next place of delivering on that commitment and that intent. So um, this is, first, we're going to go through some information about what is really driving this um, and understanding the forces behind what is pushing us now to this next place in time. Um, and really, as was said by Kalima and Barbara Palmer, um, today is the first day 
on this journey here with APD, that this is about all of you helping APD reorganize their infrastructure in a way that makes it easier for you in the field to actually deliver on what this promise is all about. Um, this is going to take work. This isn't going to happen today. Um, we're going to talk about what you need to pay attention to as we move into this next phase of implementing your transition plan to move ACDS services to your place. Um, Florida has made a strong, strong commitment on employment first um, with your governor's initiative to improve employment for all people with disabilities in the state. And kudos to you at the DD Council in the state for your lead. Um, I can't compliment Sheila Swift more um, than anyone else in the room about staying tenacious on keeping that front and center in everybody's mind here in the state. Um, and really, part of that is then driven I am not doing well with this. How about your clicker is not working at all? Um, I'll keep going. So behind the change is certainly one of the biggest things are the constituents that are dependent on the services that we deliver. Um, their their conversation, um, their voices are getting louder and clearer. Um, so certainly um, it's people's choice that's important. We're talking about what are the federal laws that have been enacted in 2014 um, that are demanding we change our system, and certainly all the dynamic of the culture, the community, the the, the um, financing within a state. All that matters. Um, and more importantly, we're talking about how do we sustain the system going forward through these changes. Um, here in Florida, you're faced with huge waiting lists. Um, your structures and what you're financing for services today doesn't meet your demand for tomorrow. Um, so how do we take that into consideration as we think about what are the pieces that we need to put in place? I'm thinking more about the um, employment first list. Scully part. Oh, good. Sorry, guys. Technology is not our friend in Florida today. I think I got it. <laughs> and it is working. Hopefully, um, those of you that are in distance um, viewing this um, are seeing what the rest of us in the room are seeing. So national and state um, disparities is an important part of the conversation. Um, despite all of the resources we've invested in our system, we still have huge differences in um, access to regular everyday employment um, for people with disabilities. Um, it's not on an equitable access as it is for those of us without disabilities. And we are at a point in time in our country where our whole workforce, our working age adult population is hitting um, a record place that we've never experienced in the history of this country where our workforce doesn't meet the demand of our industries, all industries. And those of you that are providers in the field um, feel this quite acutely in your recruitment of staff these days to fill positions for the existing services, let alone thinking about um, what we need in staff to deliver services differently moving forward and the bridge and transition of the workforce that we need to help us through that bridge. So um, we do need to recognize this disparity and keep it in mind as we move forward. In oh, I am really not doing well with this. How do I get rid of that? I'm not on you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so I'm not going to go through this chart. Part of the slides are really about giving you some information to take away with you and reflect as we work through some of this work over the next um, months, years. Um, it's not going to be done overnight. And when we start figuring out what we need to know, we're going to learn new things that we didn't know yet. Um, 
that we do know that individuals with disabilities um, still are not accessing the workforce. We do know, um, those of us that have been in the field for a while, I admit I'm one of those that have been around since the 70s, um, there are a lot of myths and in, um, misinterpretations about what is possible um, in terms of helping someone, even with the most complicated challenges, accessing employment. Um, we do have the knowledge and the research to move um, forward in helping them access employment in the general workforce. Um, what we don't have yet are the, thank you, David. And um, David knows I have allergies and pretty soon my voice, and um, I'll start coughing and sneezing. Um, I appreciate that. David just um, delivered water for those of you that are on the um, phone in the distance that didn't know what just happened in the room. Um, so thinking about those myths and misconceptions, we're going to have to think through them and help think of communication strategies throughout the state of Florida that help people understand the possibilities and teach providers and in direct support staff um, and families and individuals how to get through um, knowing what they don't know yet. Um, it's pretty scary. Um, our system of home and community-based services has been built on compliance. I will say that right up front. Um, <laughs> the smiles in the audience. Um, yeah, we have paid more attention to What's your choice and how do you have that choice within the compliance um, that we demand? Um, we're in a new world. We're talking about um, giving permission to take calculated risk and helping people understand, particularly families. Um, young folks in this field, I know, and tell me this all the time, if only mom and dad would let me. Um, and I will tell you just a really brief story. I worked with a young man in Pennsylvania many, many years ago when I was in the provider world for a while. And we were, we did close to ADT programs and um, help individuals move into employment and other community supports. And this one young man who was very talented, he actually used to, he had a driver's license and could drive himself to the program. Um, so why was he there? What did he need? Um, and I kept saying, why, can we, like, help you get a job and get out of here? Um, that's what he wanted. But he lived with his senior elder father, and there was no other family, and he would never budge. And about two years ago, when I was at Nazi, so I've been at Nazi for 12 years now, um, he called me. I didn't even know he could find me anymore, because this is since the early 2000s. He called me one day at the office and said, Lee, I'm ready to find a job. My father passed away. I was just so devastated. Um, but it's, I tell that story because there are folks that have wishes and ideas and dreams that we need to help them say out loud and we need to be hearing them and be responsive to them. Um, and get over um, the disparity in the system and the myths that we think are in place. So I'm going to keep going because I can't do this. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the um, influences, the national influences. First and foremost, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act um, since the 1990s that we're trying to finally take to the next step of implementation. I'm sure all of you are well aware of that. Um, but truthfully, when we look at what's happening with um, CMS and the Medicaid Home and Community-Based Waiver, it's really about CMS um, living up to their um, commitment to implementation of ADA. That's behind, behind, that's the core of what's behind this, as is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and the Department of Labor living up to the commitment of the ADA. Um, we have been slow in shifting our federal resources to bridge the gap between those disparities um, for people with disabilities in this country and their rights and their um, full citizenship responsibilities. 
Um, we are in a point in time where there's a great deal of changing demographics in this country. All of you know that um, the whole, we've been talking about the baby boom generation um, moving out, so we have a brain drain in our service system. Um, that affects what um, work we need to do in making sure the younger generation who has far more talents than we are accessing yet today um, and bridging the knowledge gap from and using their talents with the knowledge of those of us that have been in the system a long time. Um, there is a influx of proposed federal legislation eliminating subminimum wages in this country. We're not going to talk about that a great deal today, but it is definitely influencing um, part of this force that is pushing us to shift to the next place in our system. The ADA um, <clears throat> was the first comprehensive civil rights um, law in this country, and all of you know that um, it was really to end discrimination in employment. That was front and center in the ADA way back when. Um, we're still um, in the early stages of working on delivering on that. Um, and the access to public services. And I said public services about the funding that CMS, the Department of Labor, has given us in the field to actually implement things. Um, and great deal around telecommunications that we are just barely scratching the surface on. Um, we'll talk more about that because one of the solutions we know in our field is to use technology more, even to help with some of the direct support workforce crisis. Um, I'm going to just highlight things, but as the year goes on here in Florida, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty, or APD is going to get into the nitty-gritty of this. Um, and really today is about soliciting your help in knowing what's working. Because looking at some of your data here in Florida, um, there are some pockets of things that are happening in your state that are absolutely working for people. So how do we make sure that what is happening in those places can be shared so people know what's happened and why and what they're doing that could be replicated? And certainly recognizing that very difference between rural Florida and Jacksonville and Miami and even here in Tallahassee is more um, urban and offers different opportunities than in rural environments. But you have some very creative rural communities here. I am impressed. I've had the opportunity to sit in on some of your employment first collaborative efforts over the years. Um, and I often tout what you've done here in Florida to other states in the country when we're talking about what is possible in very rural environments that up until the day a change happens had no providers to actually deliver services. So um, you do have some stuff and knowledge here in, in this state. It's a matter of making sure everybody knows that. So um, we'll, we'll be bringing that to the table. Um, the Olmstead decision. This is really about the um, challenge to all of us that we recognize that um, people with disabilities do not need segregated institutional environments to thrive. As a matter of fact, we know they don't thrive in those environments. And it's the um, decision in this country that we honor people's choices, respect who they are as people, and drives what we talk about in person-centered practices. Um, I am grateful for this first decision of national significance that has implemented the intent of ADA. We can't lose sight of it. Um, and we talk about individuals' choices, and we have to also help them understand their responsibilities for the choices they make. And they can't take those responsibilities for the choices they make without understanding um, what are the consequences of the choices they're making and have enough information and experience. Um, I would repeat that a thousand and one times I have learned that if we don't help people take those calculated risks, that includes individuals, families, providers, state-level systems, those of us that um, 
talk about this on a national level. We take risks when we're out there um, to push us to the next place of experience because that's how we learn. And not to get all hung up or um, I'll just say mean. I'm, I'm channeling um, some colleagues of mine that would say, we've gotten really mean in our system about our compliance um, challenges. We hide behind some of our health and safety challenges. And not to minimize that, it is our responsibility as people that um, other those with disabilities depend on not to put them in unsafe situations, but it is also our responsibility to um, create those backup plans to assure that when they take risks and experience things they've never had the opportunity to experience, that we have a backup plan to make sure they're safe about it. Um, so um, we'll get into that. And, and how does the state design service definitions that encourage providers to have the flexibility to take some of those risks? Because that's what it's going to take us to move to the next place. So I'm going to let Mary talk a little bit about um, some of the really details of the home and community-based waiver expectations, because we all have to remember these as we take those calculated risks. Thanks so much, Ree. And um, I'm very grateful, again, I, uh, the opportunity of the mic to just say thank you to the folks in Florida for having us here today. Um, just a little bit of background. So we are with the National Association of Safety D Directors. Ree has extensive experience working in every state in the country, I think, on issues of employment and is nationally recognized for her expertise. And before coming to NASDES, I worked both consulting but spent most of my career at a state level in Maryland and at CMS um, on the Home and Community-Based Services Program. So it's always my pleasure to be talking about the HCBS uh, regulation. And I'll, I always I warned Kalima a little bit earlier that I never stay on script. But, you know, one of the important things about the HCBS rule that seems to have dominated the conversation is all about the settings requirements. And I'll be talking about that today because it is a pivotal and, and, and certainly has been an area of extraordinary effort within the state to work toward compliance with those provisions of the rule. But I wanted to take a moment just to re remind folks, any policy wants in the room that have a copy of the reg that they read through, I highly encourage it. It's a great cure for insomnia. Um, but it's um, but it's also just, it, it's good to, to, to not only sort of read the text of the regulation, it's not as dense as it might seem, but also a lot of the prelude to it and so sort of explaining why CMS made the decisions that they did. But there are really some other important provisions that haven't gotten the spotlight quite as um, heavily as the settings requirements. And those really relate, and we alluded to this a little bit more, to the there's an, you know, expectation that individuals have person-centered plans and that there are expectations, you know, there's a really important provision within the regulation that, that the um, uh, services and supports reflect what's important for the person. So those issues of health and safety, those things that, you know, we do have an obligation within the Hemisphere Community Based Services waiver to assure health and welfare, um, but it's also what's important to the person. And so making sure that individuals' rights, um, preferences, desires are really taken into account as you're shaping those services and supports for folks and giving opportunities to um, really explore things that perhaps hadn't heretofore been available to individuals. And the other piece of the rule that, you know, um, all aimed at trying to enhance the opportunities for choice and control. So there's conflict of interest requirements within the rule. There are sort of stakeholder engagement expectations within the rule so that states can work in partnership, much like APD is doing right now with you. Um, as a, and I'd say this is the beginning of the journey, um, but to, to really engage with you and, and build the systems together because, frankly, all of you have that expertise. So, I, you know, the HCBS regulation, so much of it does hinge on the settings requirements, which we'll talk about, um, but there are so many other provisions in there that really complement the expectations that individuals have an opportunity to have a good life and have opportunities to engage in employment and relationship building in the community. And so, this, you know, the, this is probably old hat for folks, but the, um, I, it's no longer really the new rule, right? It was uh, promulgated in, um, in January of 2014 and became effective March 17, 2014 for all of the provisions of the rule except those that related to the settings in which HCBS were delivered. And that, in, in that instance, CMS um, originally proposed a five-year implementation period and has since extended that. So states are really working diligently to identify the strategies they'll use to make sure that the settings in which the services are provided meet the requirements of the rule. So they really do focus the regulations focus, as you all probably know intuitively and are thinking reflectively on your own services, um, that it really uh, 
focuses on the quality of the individual's experience um, and the, the, the nature of the setting in which, it, um, it, which the services are delivered. So in other words, CMS is really looking to make sure that the setting isn't isolated from the broader community, that individuals have opportunities to engage in the community to the same degree that individuals who don't receive Medicaid HCBS have to offer. So um, it really is uh, um, experiential, but also looking at the quality of the supports and services that are available for individuals. Go ahead. And you know, the, the other thing I'll, I'll just take a little diversion off is CMS has continued, you know, this hasn't been, um, the regs themselves don't stand by themselves. The CMS has issued additional guidance, um, it's called for the wonks in the room sub-regulatory guidance, sort of those things that help put a little meat on the bones of the regulations on what the expectations are with regard to the regulations. And so if you haven't um, yet, there's a lot of information on the CMS website about sort of frequently asked questions or additional guidance and what they meant by certain terms of art. And I know the folks at APD and ACA are probably well steeped in that, but I'd encourage everyone to become familiar because it really does put some um, real life context to the HCBS rule. Um, and, and one of the um, elements of that is really what is integrated, um, what is the setting, what does it mean when the setting is integrated in and supports access to the full community. And there was a lot of discussion earlier around sort of um, what would that mean in a rural context? What would that mean in an urban context? And how does that, might that differ? And really taking it back to that one provision of the rule that's sort of to the same extent that individuals in that community who don't receive HCBS have access to. And so having that be a bellwether for folks has been something that's been very helpful for individuals and, and providers alike. Um, and as states have gone through the process of identifying sites that might need to do work on a few things, um, but or sites that are fully compliant with the expectations of the rule. And importantly, the rule also, um, it, it certainly provided uh, expectations for provider-owned and operated settings, but it also provided more uh, broad-based um, expectations around individuals receiving HCDS writ large. And one of those is sort of that it supports the opportunity for individuals to seek competitive integrated employment, um, which is something that hadn't, hadn't been issued in federal rule prior to that. Um, and so it really does raise the uh, ante for states to think about how they can promote a service delivery system that really gives individuals that opportunity. It doesn't prescribe that every individual has to go down that path, but indeed that the opportunity is available for individuals to pursue. And that's still quite a high bar for states as they're thinking about how their services have evolved over time um, and really where those partnerships across um, agencies within the state with the federally um, funded partners within the state really becomes an important uh, strategy to make sure that you've got, you're all swimming in the same direction to offer those opportunities. And then finally, um, the, 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 and I already mentioned this, I, I, I trump myself in um, the slides, but really making sure that individuals, that, that access is really on a parity with individuals who don't receive HCBS. And all of this is just contextual, that you've got sort of the backdrop of not just sort of all the ADA pieces that we mentioned, HCBS rule requirements. There's certainly always other things that are a priority within CMS, and so making sure that all the services are delivered in a truly person-centered fashion can really strengthen your opportunities to meet, meet and frankly exceed what we've, you know, come to realize is the floor of compliance and really build a system of quality that really uh, gives individuals the opportunity to explore new experiences. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ree for the remainder, but um, know that the uh, – uh, certainly the, the HCBS regulation provides, it might not always feel like it, but a wonderful opportunity for this reflection within the state to think about services in a new way. So we're going to talk a bit about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Has everyone in the room um, had a brief or at least a beginning knowledge of that Workforce Act? Anybody not know much about it? Well, um, it is it is one of our... I have um, come to believe it's one of our landmark federal laws, believe it or not. Um, the true intent of this regulation was to, in our national workforce system, um, close the disparity gap between workers with and without disabilities. Um, so a whole lot of, of things in this act, even though in our field we only are paying attention to one little component of it, it really is changing the landscape of um, how we build the workforce in the United States, um, how we address education 
um, of the next generation of working age adults in this country. Um, and certainly um, for us, there's a section within this law that um, is referred to so commonly as the 511 section. Um, everybody hear about 511? Okay, good. <laughs> um, for those of you that may not, um, it's a section of the law that really has taken a clear stand in this country that the younger generation coming out of our education system are led on a different path than they have led, been led on in the past, at least for students with disabilities. But it also, um, if you go further into the law, they take into account youth without disabilities that are other from other disenfranchised um, populations. Kids live in poverty, um, and um, I will not say any more about that because I'll go down the rabbit hole. But anyway, for our population, Section 511 is critically important to, to know about and understand. Um, a whole new set of services for youth with disabilities is called for, both by the Department of Education, for, from the Department of Education, and from the um, voc rehab systems and the workforce system in general around supporting youth. Um, and it's critically important. And one of the things, let me um, take a step aside for a minute. One of the things we know um, that's important about systems change um, or any time we're doing improvements in our systems is the importance of collaboration across systems. We have to work across um, our perceived silos or agency boundaries. We cannot afford to be so focused in the IDD system that it's all about the HCBS settings rule. Um, there are resources, there are other influences from other departments, um, keep looking at you, <laughs> about um, the influence of voc rehab. Um, your voc rehab system in the state is embarking on how are they redefining their service definitions or their types of service that they're going to ask you to deliver and that they're going to pay for and how they're going to finance that. That has to be aligned with what APD does with their employment and, I will say, day and residential services. We don't talk so much about the influence of day and employment service financing and service definitions on how um, we expect employment outcomes to happen, but they do those other service types and the funding for those other service types and how they're aligned or not with employment services matters and with folk rehab service types. Um, I would encourage every employment provider in the state to be able to deliver services to any population that um, needs employment services, not just people with IDD. So those of you that are providers for only the IDD population, um, plant that in the back of your head. In time to maintain your organizations and prioritize employment, um, diversifying the groups of people you provide employment services to will be helpful to you as a business model. Um, just things to plant in the back of your minds today is what we're doing. Um, so the Workforce Act is really about um, this burden of uh, unemployment for people with disabilities and calling that out. Um, Mary used the phrase competitive integrated employment. That is a phrase of what we mean by employment. And this is the first time in our country that we have a, a law that defines what we mean by competitive integrated employment. Um, Voc Rehab has been for their entire existence um, worked off of this notion of um, competitive employment, but we've never defined what we mean by that until this federal law, and they added the word competitive integrated employment, because you can have competitive employment and be in a segregated workforce. Um, those that deliver services in sheltered workshops know the argument that we, that's been had over the years that that's competitive employment because um, we pay wages that are based on, even though they're sub-minimum wages, they're based on a prevailing wage. Prevailing wage is competitive employment. Um, so we get all caught up in how we use language. So one of the things that, that's a task here in Florida 
is to join together and be clear about what and how you're going to measure that employment outcome. Um, we will encourage you to stay steady with the federal definition of competitive integrated employment as that brass ring out there that we're reaching for. That doesn't mean other types of employment aren't valuable and important as we move through this phase. But what we're really trying to get to is closing that disparity gap and having um, people with disabilities have the same access as anyone else in that opportunity for real competitive integrated employment and really to increase their economic status in this country. Um, our system, um, sadly, is designed in a way that encourages the continuation of keeping people with disabilities and their families surviving at the poverty level or barely above it and oftentimes below it. Um, that is one of the intended changes that we're moving forward. Um, and when we're talking about the Workforce Act, and in some glimpse for you um, in some of the federal legislation that's coming out around the um, ending of subminimum wage. And at the federal level, the conversation is a six-year phase out for the most part in the legislation that we're seeing for those of you that were interested in that. Um, but we have the federal government also in our Congress, both sides of the aisle, um, understanding that if we're going to improve employment for people with disabilities, even those with the most significant challenges and barriers to entering the workforce, we have to think about the other part of day life supports. Um, we know we're not going to ship quickly or even as fast as I would wish um, for all of those folks dependent on us to help them get full employment or living wages where they're not so dependent on our public systems for everything in their life. But we have to pay attention to how do we support folks when they're not working? Um, how do we break down those barriers to just having a mountain about doing fun activities to helping them be active citizens in this in their communities, being part of the actual fabric of decision making in their communities, whether they're on the on on civic boards or um, become elected officials. Even um, we have to be thinking about um, supporting lives in places that have been totally foreign to our thinking. Um, so the Workforce Act actually does encourage that in the the um, work that we're doing with youth. Um, we have to be careful about how we implement 511 um, because it very quickly can lead students down the path of traditional segregated services um, and that takes partnership and understanding between your education systems at the local level your voc rehab systems at the local level, your case managers and what they know and how they help people find information through the state Medicaid systems. So employment first, kudos to Florida. You guys have been one of the movers and shakers in this whole world of promoting employment first policies in the country. Your governors have, governor has taken a strong stand. Um, I get that you still struggle with implementation, um, not, a, not stepping aside from that, um, but you have taken a very high-level stand in this and, and deserve a lot of recognition and credit for that. Currently, we have 38 states that have official employment for policies. Um, 20 states have passed legislation, as you have in Florida. Um, 18 with executive orders and 26 with cross-disability policies, and that's something you've recognized here in Florida. One of the reasons I mentioned earlier that those of you that are providers of employment services think about employment across all disability populations. Um, even people that um, come out of a world of physical disabilities or substance abuse challenges that have been out of the workforce for a while or mental health challenges, they face the same barriers. And some of the knowledge that we need to build for the employment specialists that are delivering employment services on the front line, um, knowing how to serve people with most complicated challenges, regardless of what they are, whether it's not having been in the workforce for 20 years or 
they have such a complicated medical challenge that there's no question that they can't um, have a whole day um, in a general job, um, that they need downtime. Um, there are models that, that can help with that. And the more we can train our staff to be creative and know those different models of service delivery, the better off we're going to be. Um, we use the phrase customized employment within the Workforce Act these days, and that's a very important thing to pay attention to. Um, does everybody know the phrase, who does not know the phrase of customized employment? If you could just raise your hand for a minute. Um, thank you. One of the clear pieces of that in the federal workforce regulation is defining the importance of a discovery period to help someone and the folks working with them know how to help them down that path to employment. What are their interests? What are they, what are they all about? What are the challenges around um, most people with disabilities don't have the opportunity to have a driver li driver's license and then a car to get them to and from work. So what, what do we know about them? What do we need to discover about their situation that um, we need to pay attention to in helping them get to that phase of actually going about the job search? In our HCBS, Home and Community-Based World, that was the intent of Prevoke Services from the very, very beginning. Um, we lost delivering on that intent. The Workforce Act now is challenging us through this service model called customized employment and that very um, initial piece of it, which is referred to as discovery, just translate that into person-centered um, planning and thinking. Um, if we start talking about what do we mean by these different words, we'll be able to understand the differences in the system. But that's what discovery is, and that's what the beginning of customized employment is. The other piece of customized employment that the workforce challenges us to do is to work with employers to help them expand their workforce and develop new positions that expand their industries. Um, it's not helping someone just fit into a job that already exists, but creation of new jobs within industry. That's the other piece of customized employment and an encouragement of the Workforce Act. Workforce Act also invests in the top calls this country to invest in the top five industries in any location. So here in Florida, and as you think about your regions in Florida, um, there are resources outside HCBS services and outside Voc Rehab that are about helping employers invest in the workforce to deliver in expanding and training their workforce um, to deliver on what their industries need. Our home and community-based long-term care service industry is one of those top five industries in this country. So we'll get into helping you tap in and understanding that part, but that's another component of the workforce. And I have to go faster, don't I? Because um, we want David to talk about some details. I'm going to make you um, think about some data. Um, some of you have already seen these slides, and I'll try to do this quick. Um, one of the other messages that Mary and I have for you is that um, as you explore new ways of doing things, um, it's critically important that you know your information. What do you know? What do you not know? What do you need to know? Um, I'm going to give you some um, little bit of information about what we know nationally about day and employment services, where we're funding, how we're funding it. Um, where you are here in Florida, and then I'm going to ask David Darn to, Darn to come up and share some more detail with you about specifics here in Florida, because there's some, there's some inklings in your data that show um, really positive potential, so I'm encouraged by that. So in the country, over, since 1990, um, we have seen a huge growth in non-work services. That's an area that we have to be very cautious of. That little story I told you about my friend from Pennsylvania way long ago, he would be in that non-work services. But we never really listened to why he didn't want employment. And I forever feel badly that um, 
we didn't spend more time with his family and understand his family dynamics. We have to understand how to support families differently than we do today. Um, they are part of the key in helping move the system forward. So we need to bring their voices more front and center in all of this. Um, Non-work is not just the option. Um, we need to help people improve their lives, and that means they need more income. Great news here in Florida. You're changing your Medicaid um, max on, on your assets. Um, that will come out, and we'll talk more about that another day, but that's the beginning stages of it, that um, we have to recognize that people with disability do not need or should not have to live at or below poverty just to survive with their disability. That's just not okay as an equal U.S. citizen. Um, Facility-based work, that's our sheltered workshops in this country, has been going down for a while. We did have some peaks and valleys, but that continues to decrease. Um, that's been phasing out and will continue to phase out. Um, just a little bit of side news. Um, we have been tracking the number of employers, both whether they're providers or businesses or school districts in this country, and since the Workforce Act was enacted in 2014, we have seen the decrease in providers across this country drop or not be reauthorized their subminimum wage certificates by about half. Um, we'll get more into that another day, but um, so it's, that's not the main point. The main point is really about in, improving integrated employment. We do see a little bit of uptick. You can see that in the far end in 2016. It jumped a little bit higher in 2017 data. So encouraging. We're on we're on a path. We're finally um, are turning the corner on improving integrated employment services and um, moving that far. But we have to watch how much we're letting float into non-work. We cannot write off those folks with significant disabilities um, in our thinking. They're the biggest challenge. It's not a population that you can easily say, you know, there's an opening at I don't know what it is. I'll just say McDonald's because we all go there. And there's no being at McDonald's. Let's see if you can fit into that job. That's not where we need to go, folks. Um, so we need to learn and teach our direct support employment staff how to work through those challenges. And, um, yes, here in Florida, you have major issues with the structuring and the methodology of your financing of services. Um, I know APD has been really behind the eight ball and feeling a lot of pressure to change those. Their intent is to get there. It's not as easy as just from one year to the next reshifting how you finance your services, but that will come. Um, the system will demand that, and that will come. Um, there is creativity coming here within your already existing financing, so we need to tap into how and why that's happening and how do we share that so we can improve that everywhere. Um, this is a state that still only um, invests 11% of all your day and employment service money into um, integrated employment services. There are states across the country, as you see from this, that do really well with that. Those outliers are Washington State and the second one in um, Oklahoma and Massachusetts, I mean, um, Connecticut is up there too. But let me tell you something about Washington State if you don't already know it. They're a state that long ago um, their legislator did not invest in the IDD system very well. And their state took the position that Employment was about helping people get out of poverty. Um, their state is committed to increase the or decrease the number of their citizens, be it with or without disabilities, that live at poverty level or just above or below poverty. Um, so their whole thinking was about we have to invest in people um, self-sufficiency. And they didn't offer um, the full array of day and employment and even residential services that other states did. 
So for a very long time, if you lived in Washington State and you needed support from the IDD system, um, you were automatically told that the services we provide are services to help you get a job. That was front and center. Um, and because of that, they are um, a state in this country that is the highest in investing in employment through their HCBS system. They do that across all populations. So if you looked at their mental health data um, and their other physical disabilities employment data, you would see the same thing. Um, Oklahoma was a state that was driven by a lawsuit that um, demanded that people moving out of institutions, their first and foremost discussion was, where are you going to move, where are you going to work when you leave this institution? Something we don't talk about about Oklahoma, but it has driven the investment in um, the amount of money they invest in day and employment services. So we know it's possible. We know those outliers are not where you are here in Florida. So replicating what they've done is not um, your option for today. Um, but we can help you get more to the middle. We know what it takes to do that. Um, and it takes that collaboration across all systems. It takes redefining what services you offer. It takes bridging services between what exists today and what the new services are and who accesses what services when, um, you will get to a point where you're going to have to have the hard conversation about for new folks coming into your system, what do they have access to? What do they don't have access to? Um, we do want to offer choices to everyone, but we want to also offer choices that honor what their dreams and wishes and needs are for the future, not just what we have today to offer them. So works in an integrated employment in the nation. Now this comes from um, core indicators, so it's all IDD information. We know now that 19% um, of people actually have jobs in the community. And we do know when we dig down into the detail of this um, information, it's not just the folks that we think of as having the high-level skills that it's easy to help them get a job. This in involves people with very complex challenges as well. Um, people in individual jobs is about 14%. Remember I said the term under the Workforce Act that we need to keep front and center for that um, gold ring is competitive integrated employment. Those are the folks in individual jobs. We want to help folks get in jobs that are part of the fabric of, of our general workforce. That's the ultimate goal. Um, yes, we'll have other things going on, um, but we are seeing that increase. It's 14% right now. Um, we do want to recognize that those with long-term um, disability challenges, they're always going to need support on the job. So even though our voc rehab systems headset, and forgive me for how I say this to you guys, the voc rehab staff in the room, is that um, voc rehab is short term, we'll get you in a job and then we step away. It is our responsibility in long-term care services to pick up the pieces and know when to be at the sides of individuals and at the sides of employers that continue those long-term supports. Um, that does not mean one-to-one -one job coaching. Hear me when I say that. There are ways to phase out of support on the job. Um, we are seeing employers around the country stepping up because they're, they're needing more workers. Um, we are at, what is it, 2% unemployment in this country. Um, the demand for workers across all industries is at a, a historical high. Our employers are looking at ways to bring this workforce, disability, folks into their um, their businesses, um, and they are learning how to provide supports and accommodations on the jobs in ways they never knew possible before. So we have a lot of work to do around that, so we can't forget that in our system for folks with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we may be um, and likely providing long-term supports in order to get individuals with those complicated challenges into the general workforce. We want to talk about, um, oh, really fast. I want you to, this is all about learning to know what data we have, what we need to pay attention to, and, and 
keep an eye on it over time as we set benchmarks and goals and um, different tech endpoints. Are the changes, are the experiments, are the risk-taking we're doing across all our systems um, planning out the way we intended, or are they, or are they not? Um, we do know that individuals with jobs are earning better wages. That's not rocket science. You would assume that. Um, group support employment, we have to be cautious that we don't build too much of that. That's one of the things I've learned in working with um, Oklahoma. Um, they built group supported employment stronger than they did individual employment. Um, they built the same rates for group as they did individual employment. And in reality, that didn't help them get people into that competitive integrated job or to reach that um, ultimate goal that we want to do. So here in Florida, I know your um, rate structures aren't broken apart like that yet, but that will be one of the things we want to think about. Um, you do have a huge challenge about that funding. We will not ignore that. Um, it's not going to be changed overnight. Um, but it's part of the puzzle that we will help you put together. So, David, let me let you talk specifically about here in Florida and the data you have. Thank you, Ree. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, I'll take a really quick aside just to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my name is David Darm. I have been uh, involved in this initiative of trying to, as part of our state systems change effort for the last eight years, um, particularly in this role with APD for two years, I've um, been very excited about the work that we've been doing over the last several years to try to address this issue. Uh, this, but, but for those of you who don't know me, this is actually very personal for me, um, not just because I'm a policy wonk and liking to see change at a policy level, but also because I do have a disability. I'm visually impaired. So one of the advantages to public speaking for me is that I can't see facial expressions. So if you're bored or just like rolling your eyes, it just does not phase me. I can keep going. Um, I also need to, I, I would be remiss not to introduce my uh, guide dog here, Ranger. He is uh, all responsible for all tech issues with this uh, whole event. So any kind of tech issue complaints, those of you on the webinar, please refer him to my guide dog, Ranger. He will be happy to respond to you when he wakes up. Um, as we said, this is, uh, Ria's talked a lot about, uh, all these different efforts that are happening, both at the national level and state level. And in this particular, this is really to introduce the topic to you all, for those of you, you know, to get everyone up to speed, and also seeing what is the data telling us? Are these efforts, what is the effect that these efforts are having? So the good news is, is that for APD, uh, for the last eight years, uh, there has been a positive uh, increase in terms of the number of people we have found who are um, competitively employed in an integrated setting. Uh, this chart here on this slide shows that we have about um, shy of 3,000 individuals, both on our waiver and waiting list, who have been um, reported employed. You will notice that in 2013 that number increased. That was because the Florida legislature and our leadership in, in our state um, invested in doing employment uh, supported employment services for folks on our waiting list. That's our employment enhancement program. And that, when that took effect, there was a huge push to get people aware of this service to support individuals, particularly those who are coming out of school, to be aware that these services exist so that they're not just sitting on the waiting list, um, that we could be able to collaborate with voc rehab, with the schools, to be able to support individuals um, in terms of employment and internship opportunities. So this is the positive news. Now, uh, next slide. The negative side, the, the concerning news, is that we still have a long way to go in terms of changing. We talk about system change. It really is a, a culture change. Our model, our IDD system, has largely been built on um, a medical model and less in terms of thinking in terms of employment. That is just the reality of our, our situation, and these numbers kind of show how that is how that is being demonstrated in the community. Um, this is the National Core Indicator Survey that showed that there were many individuals that were interviewed who said they wanted to work. About 41% of the individuals surveyed said they wanted to work in the community, but only 19% of those individuals had employment as a goal on their service plan. Now, there are multiple reasons why that could be, uh, but I think at the end of the day, it comes down to changing the culture and understanding that employment 
can be a viable option and how do we help people getting towards that. One of the things Rhea and I talked about yesterday is it's not simply the, the, the part as we go forward into thinking of a redesign is not simply, okay, do you want a job and you get a job. There are multiple uh, steps to being aware of what, what are the op- opportunities that are available for you to learn about having a job and what it fits in your skill set. So it's not simply just we want people to go just get a job. It's a matter of having that conversation and trying to help people through that process. Just like all of us, when we started our work, we didn't have it all figured out at the beginning. There needed to be that process that we all had to go through. Next slide. This is kind of to reiterate what we had shared with the other data points is that we have our system, uh, we have seen a pretty uh, increase, if you will, in terms of all our non-work and facility-based activities compared to those who are receiving supported employment through our waiver. Um, the numbers here show that we've had about a, a pretty much a stagnant uh, participation in individuals receiving supported employment, about 2,200. That compares to about 13,000 individuals who are in facility-based adult day training uh, who spend most of their day there. Uh, so we see a disparity in terms of the participation. One of the reasons is also, if you think the next slide, shows the disparity also in our funding. This is not a surprise to many of you that we spend our wa- – this is our waiver now uh, – spends a significantly more amount invested in the facility-based adult day training uh, compared to supported employment. Last year, we spent about $85 million in facility-based ADT compared to less than $5.2 million in supported employment. So when we talk a lot about the what we can do to look at ways to redesign, um, how do we maybe close some of these gaps, uh, and not just in terms of the funding, but also in terms of the participation and opportunities uh, going into uh, a redesign, how can we shift some of these things? Next slide shows what we're looking at for the redesign is also just considering what are the trends that are going on. I have many things that we can, I could say that our waiver needs to improve upon. One of the positives that we have is that, for those of you who do not know, we structured our waiver to where you can adjust your hours in life skills development. So you can receive part of your day to be in an employment, in a job, and part of your day could be in an adult day training program. Uh, and so this data, this is just kind of a snapshot of people who were spending, um, what were their, what were their spending, um, trends. Uh, the, you can obviously tell from the average of the, uh, second, um, column here, or sorry, second row, that there still is about, uh, a significant amount more is being spent on adult day training, uh, per person versus, uh, supported employment. What's interesting in this data is that it shows that also that those who two we had about 275 individuals who spent both on ADT and supported employment, that we saw that their average actually went down. In fact, their average on total life skills development services was lower than those who spent most of their time in an adult day training program. So that was kind of interesting and, and something for us to think about as we are encouraging uh, particularly individuals who are in an ADT program to consider employment and looking at their options, how that's going to affect their spending, uh, not just on ADT, but on their total uh, services together. So um, there's more to come. There are multiple things that we want to look at in, in what we want to hear from you as stakeholders uh, as far as what are the what are the things that we need to consider that influence employment, that in, increase individuals' opportunities for success in employment, but also ensuring that we not forget about the other services that they need and not having um, neglecting those needs that, that also need to be met, such as the meaningful day activities that happen in an ADT program. I think those are the main points. We really wanted to do a quick uh, summary for our data. Um, one aside, I really want to thank um, Elizabeth and Lindsay and John. Uh, we've had a lot of technical issues here, and I, I need to thank them because they stepped in at the last second to help us pull this all together. Um, so I don't know if, if you guys mind just giving them a round of applause because they are, they are superheroes, for me at least. <laughs> so thank you all. So let's have some conversation um, and have you guys – Speak up. Yeah, but just the 
the discussion slide. Um, so this is going to demand partnership, as we said, shared knowledge, shared resources, and shared attention. Um, and we we are going to have a little more session this afternoon where we're going to talk more in depth about um, some of the possibilities that we can focus on first and second. Can you hear it? Um, yeah. Thank you, David. So. Um, Thoughts so far? What are you guys thinking as you've heard us talk about this stuff today? I'm sure some of it is repeat for many of you. Anything strike you? Just shift to the next slide. So someone um, start this out. What was a what in from your where you sit today? What is the biggest challenge that you think of that how how can I possibly do this? We'll just go ahead. Thank you. The biggest challenge I see from a provider perspective is the Florida rate system uh, is problematic as far as covering the cost of care. I have I'm, um, with the provider association. I have not seen resistance for systems change and giving people the services they should have, but there are problems and restrictions with the current rate structure, some problems within the support employment model that I think, you know, can look at and be addressed. But if I had to say the primary barrier and challenge, it's the current rate structures that providers are having to work under. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Suzanne Sewell, Florida Association of Rehabilitation Facilities. Thank you. Uh, Jim Whitaker. I'm the CEO of the Arch Jacksonville. Uh, I echo Suzanne's uh, sort of comments. Our system is broken right now as far as the funding, and I certainly would not want to see a service such as ADT funded less because it's not supported today, uh, it's about, in our case, we get about 60% from Med Waiver, and we're actually funding at the other 40%. And supported employment is about the same thing. Uh, with VR being paid on benchmarks uh, is very difficult. Uh, we expend an enormous amount of staff time, and sometimes jobs just don't work out, so we're back to zero. So the whole system needs to be looked at. So I think the cure is going to be the system needs to be funded adequately uh, for all services. And when we look at other states, Florida is at the bottom. We do know that. Someone else? Thank you. Well, I think the problem, well, there there are a lot of problems, but it's not one of these issues where we fix one area and everything's going to be fixed because there's so many things. But one of the things um, in working with my 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 issues and other people helping other people because I'm a certified benefits planner as well. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about um working and losing services and how much money you can make and I mean I get parents all the time that are saying Social Security told me I could only work twenty my child could only work twenty hours a week. That's false. Okay. So um and then like in the system I think as someone who gets med waiver services, if you do you get into competitive employment? It's like the service system is set up for when you need a lot of services, but then as you get more independent, it's like you have no no support. Like you still need someone to help you navigate things. You may not need someone on top of you, but it's kind of all or nothing. And so I think it it has to change with people's expectations because. I think that there's either a really low expectation or when you get to a certain degree of independence, there's a really high expectation to where you have to be like a superstar and be like above everyone else just to prove that you're 
you're at the same level, if that makes any sense. So yeah. I think it's like a multifold problem. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm Amanda Baker, and I'm the vice chair of the Employer Developmental Disability Council, and I also work as a benefits planner. Thank you, Amanda. Could I ask you a question, Amanda? Um, from your vantage point, what avenues do the families and individuals in the state get the best information? See, that's a complicated question. One of the other biggest issues is that the agencies don't talk to each other. So if you go to VR, if you don't get APD services, they're looking at you like, what's APD? And then Social Security doesn't talk to APD or VR. So it depends on where they're coming from. I mean, they're, they're just not getting a complete comprehensive amount of information no one is so that's why I stay busy because I know about all of them and so people are like well what about this and that but if they if people would just talk to each other and figure out the best way that they can work together to help the individual I think it would really help Thank a you lot for that. Uh, I, and I can tell you, I know this is the intent of APD, certainly from Kalina and David, that this is the beginning of helping people talk together so we can bring those systems more in focus. Other thoughts? So what other big challenges are there? It's not just about money. I could tell you that um, we have done some analysis of how states fund different types of services. And there's not one state in this country that has figured out the best funding for employment services um, and prioritizing that. Um, we did a, a, a deep dive into about 25 states and all the states that are on that scale of higher performing and lower performing and where are they with rates. One of the states that um, invest the most per dollar in employment services is the lowest on the scale of getting people actually into jobs. So highest payment has gotten the lowest um, outcome. So it's, we do know it's not money, though I don't want to – I say that because I don't want us to get focused on just that money's the issue. But uh, Florida has a huge issue in, in your funding methodology, not just the rates. So it's the infrastructure of, of – how you define um, what payments will be made, both on folk rehab and an APD. We know that. Um, that's part of what will be the challenge going forward is um, what other things need to happen because it does take cross-system work. It does take um, – we are we're missing the voice of case managers here today. Um, clearly, that's a voice we need to bring into this discussion going forward. Um, they are a linchpin. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That, thank you. You have a question here. I'm, I'm Willie Dawkins Miller, and I am the community liaison for supported employment with the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to say, pat ourselves on the back to say that I think that we do an exceptional job. I think that we do extremely well with the few resources that we have available to us. And though what we do is not about money, we can't do it without money, period. We have to have funding to do what we do. I mean, certainly we can get volunteer support, all of that, but you still have to have money. You have to offer incentives. You know, we have to have ways to train because most of the persons that we're trying to get employed have no pre-vocational training. So that means that we have to be able to invest in these individuals. When I go and I visit um, the ADT programs and when directors, some of the directors reluctantly let me come in, one of the issues and one of the challenges that we have is though they may have persons in there who are eligible to go to work, if I take 10 of their clients out of their program, they're going to lose that funding. Will they not? I just asked you that question. If I come in and I plug in 10 people in employment 
they're going to lose funding for 10 people. So how then do we engage the ADT and it does not become a penalty, for lack of a better term, of losing 10 people to employment and then they lose 10 persons funding? Well, you know, and I'm, and, and I may be absolutely, you know, yeah, and I just, we just need to Hi. be creative in how we do that. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Whittington. Hey, Sarah. Hey. So, um, I work in an ADT, um, Sunrise, Sunrise Communities ADT programs here in Tallahassee. And I know you, Willie, because you have come to, um, talk to people that attend our programs. And it was wonderful, and I thank you. But my reaction when you said that is, no, no, we have waiting lists. All of the day programs in this area um, have waiting lists. And really, there, there's enough demand for more programs. If the funding, you know, was solid, I think there will be more programs. So my reaction to that is, no, not at all. It would be wonderful if people got jobs because that would be great for them and then it would free up space for all these people that are waiting. So is it possible then, if, if you, when you say you have waiting lists, that means people who want to come into your program, mm -hmm. do you have a staff person there who works specifically with people who that employment piece is on their service plan? We okay, have. So she's answering it. You may have them in your program, but I'm asking, if does she have that? In my program, the people that participate, they don't really have employment as a goal. But I know there's other ADTs that have that. Have that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So that then if they don't have employment as a goal, then that itself is another challenge that we have. Are mm -hmm. they employable yeah. and can employment be a goal? If that being the case, if they are waitlist people, then, of course, we can provide supportive employment services, or they can even go through VR for phase one. And if they're not waitlist and they're med waiver, and if they're employable, which most of the individuals are, they can get the med waiver services that can be included in their service plan, and then their support coordinator could help with that. Is that not correct? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people just don't understand all of the dynamics that go into the whole delivery of services. And, yeah, and this is this is actually a really wonderful linchpin conversation that I think as you guys dig in more within the specific sort of opportunities and challenges within Florida, you'll really be noodling through. As um, I think you illustrated, Winnie, that the, everything you know, nothing in Medicaid stands alone, right? And so or within a, a, the disability service system. And so when you, it's really like a Swiss timepiece. So when you, when you sort of make adjustments to one thing, you also need to really think about the totality of the supports and services available to folks. And that's why re-reference really the importance of making sure that your partners in support coordination are also a party to this conversation because they can sometimes be extraordinarily important to setting those expectations as individuals are really doing that initial uh, person-centered plan to set goals high. Um, so it's a great, I think that's, you, you've hit on sort of the, the nut of, of what you'll be tackling as a system as you move forward together in partnership. But it sounds like you've got a lot of great thought leaders here in the room to help you think through those pieces. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth. I am going to be the voice for the people on our WebEx. So um, I'm just going to go through and read some of the comments that we've gotten so far. So... Where will funding come from to provide significant and continuing job support coaching services to allow individuals to maintain employment? Our experience is getting employers willing to carve out or create positions for individuals with performance limitations. Employers are concerned about their bottom line. Our area is primarily tourist-based. Employers have not been willing to take risks to carve out or create special positions. Those that have been willing to do so only for a couple hours a week if the employment specialist is on site for the entire time. Um, from another comment, the consumer's ability, special accommodations, high turnover um, of staff due to low wages. 
Um, challenge has been getting employers willing to carve out or create positions um, to match the individual's skills, abilities, or desires, and transportation to employment sites is a major challenge. Schools and transition specialists limit those who have needed who have needed support or assistive technologies or other accommodations and predetermined employers will not allow. The schools are starting to realize that. Yes, that one again. Schools and transition specialists limit those who have needed support or assistive technologies or other accommodations and predetermined employers will not allow. The schools are starting to realize. Yeah, that's a good one. Sorry, it sounds like there's a bit of a disconnect between students that need accommodations and automatically writing them off before you even have a conversation about employment is how I interpret that, but we'll further look into that and see if that was the intent. Um, okay, the, the business of business is to make money not to be a social human service provider and that um, employment Thomas, can you resend your question because I I'm not sure what you were saying. Um, losing the ability to provide facility-based employment paid based on production is taking an important piece out of the continuum of employment, especially for those who the most who have the most serious ability. And back to Thomas's comment, employment employment in Panacea is decreased from. I think he's talking about the location panacea in Florida. Um, yeah, so employment in panacea is decreased due to funding of the waiver. Um, and then. I think keep going. Yeah. We had someone who had a hand up over here. Hi, I'm Helena Del Monte, and I'm the CEO of ADE Inc. Association for the Development of the Exceptional in Miami. We have five ADTs, uh, but we provide ADT and supported employment. And what I've been hearing here today, apparently, we do have a bridge that is very important right now. And... I see that bridge as the south is the ADT, let's say, and that ADT must be extremely progressive in employability, skills training, life skills, and multiple skills trainings. We run a culinary training program car washing and detailing, like cosmetology, we run janitorial maintenance, help me because I have a senior moment, and bagging. We have like a, a shopping center, a, a mock shopping center, and within that, we sell the snacks, and the, the consumers actually are able to do the stocking, of, and they, they learn. They learn how to go ahead. If they need to go to public, they already know how to run a cash register. They know how to handle the cash. They know how to do the stocking, the bagging. So we're more vocational than the regular ADTs. You know, we're an ADT because also life skills. Yeah. We we run a, a a a mock apartment, okay, and there they learn how to wash their clothes and iron their clothes and make their bed and so it's life skills, also a day to day self help life skills, but it's also the vocational aspect, and that has to be the bridge to go to the north. <laughs> 
but now once they they can cross the bridge florida is such a different state from the rest of the nation and south florida is such a different area to florida so we have very, very tough time employing, and when I say we, I am now representing all agencies, having our consumers employed because they are competing with a lot of the transit prop population, and, and that is, unfortunately, even though major corporations already have set up even percentages. So my concern in the wheel that will forever be turning for our consumers, they are born with a disability and they will die with a disability and we will improve their abilities, which is the word I like. I don't like the word disabilities, but we will improve those abilities. But sooner or later, that wheel can turn one way or another and we will ha we have to have these support systems when they lose employment they need to come back to us be retrained it may happen because they had a trauma in their life a change in meds a new manager that comes in and simply does not like them so it is a revolving door and we have to understand that we have to be there for them but yes monetary situation is always our enemy and I never like the word when I hear it around APD is running in a deficit no we're not we're running in a deficit of understanding that our consumers forever will need funds through life they were not asked to be born with a condition it is a condition and, and we all need to fight so that the proper funding will be for these, you know, because no matter if we want to shoot for the sky, we will not be able to if we do not have a rocket or an airplane to get there, period. Sorry, Joelle. <laughs> More of a comment. Um, or I'm from Joelle. I'm from De Angelis. Um, I'm commenting back on somebody having a waiting list for ADT. Waiting list for ADT is great if you're not rural and there's transportation services. I don't have a waiting list. I have people who could go employment. They can't get transportation to employment. Um, there is a deficit in those areas. <laughs> so we are in the middle of nowhere. I want to just, can I echo just something with you? Hudson, Florida. <laughs> Real quick, I just want to, I think that we heard a really good point that we want to keep on our radar going into the future for the redesign is um, understanding that the, that life skills development, maybe not even necessarily our employment training specific. Sometimes it's the social, um, behavioral, um, you know, independent living skills learning that come into a, an equ in the equation of being able to compete in the workforce. Um, I really appreciated that because I, I always tell people being visually impaired, learning mobility, uh, orientation mobility, white cane skills, even though it was like not intended specifically for how you navigate a work environment, was skills that I used in my workplace. So I think those are good and important because a lot of our particular adult day training programs, they look at beyond just the specific job-related task training, but looking at beyond that, what are the other life skills training that can be used to support an individual in competing for a job in the community? Um, I will ask a question, and then we'll get to yours. Is anybody um, supporting someone in one of your community colleges or your co schools of higher education? You are? Yes, sir. I mean, anybody in the room? I mean, this is about the whole Florida system. This isn't just about, and um, okay. I just wanted to, to reflect that. Um, participating in a certificate program at a junior college. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. And do you do that through ADT services or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. You know that we receive, but. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we have 30 people enrolled. What if ADT had a service type that offered supports for that, so that you're not just building what you have needed to do um, to create those opportunities and experiences within the context, but within the context of people without disabilities? What would you think about? That. So what if so open it up at the culinary the culinary classes at the junior colleges? Could you support somebody in those classes? Yes. Okay. I think so, yes. Okay. Just trying to think about that influence. More partnerships, I guess. Yes. Partnerships. Okay. Kirk Hall, uh, CEO of the Ark of Florida. Um, I do want to reiterate the, the issue of funding simply because I think Florida's population is growing exponentially. Several years ago, we overtook that <laughs> next in line state and now we're third, uh, of course, in the nation. Um, but the funding tends to remain stagnant. It does not grow with the intense, the intensity and the growth of the need. Um, and, and we see that as a long term barrier. Uh, for sure when we're looking at how we're going to implement these services and make this kind of transition. But we also really need to focus in on those touch points. We have in the education system a, a lack of information that's being provided and a lack of expectation for the individuals that do receive information. So they leave and exit that education system without any real hope for the future. And the families they mirror that because that's what's been reinforced throughout those years. That's a lot of years for an individual to get the same message. So until we start addressing those touch points, and then when people are in centers, if there are uh, or if there is that expectation for employment, they don't necessarily get to that next step. Um, we've had uh, for the last couple of years what we call CCIR training, career counseling information referral, obviously Section 511. You alluded to earlier, um, but those individuals even there who are saying, okay, now I'm interested in employment, they're not making uh, in mass that next connection to APD services or vocational rehabilitation services or other services. Uh, you touched on some of those possibilities as well for employment. And so it's those touch places that we need to really build uh, that role as to how those services could engage the individuals in moving towards employment. And again, we want to make sure that as we're doing that, if we apply funding towards it, that we're doing it in a way that increases that funding or doesn't take away from groups who rely on that for a lifetime, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Suzanne Sewell, Florida Alp. I would just like to add another point that when we're talking about all this, the importance of flexibility and understanding that one size does not fit all. You know, we have this silo funding, multiple different sources, and we have people with horizontal needs, you know, reaching all over. Uh, you know, things like transportation. Someone may need one type of transportation, may not work for someone else. So we tend to get caught up and we only pay for this or we have so many hours of this or whatever. We just need to be looking at people's overall needs. I used to have over half of my members provide support employment. Now I think we're down to about a quarter. And it wasn't they didn't like the service and they didn't want to do it. It just was not realistic. So let's keep in mind how we can meet people's needs, realizing there will be cost to it, but there will also be savings, you know, if we can work through it all and okay people are now self-supporting and now you know we're not having to spend some of those dollars and resources so we need to keep that big picture in mind okay so back to our friends on the call um, VR isn't ready for moving large numbers of individuals from ADT or sheltered work 
not the younger graduates, but those in sheltered work for years. Many individuals have indicated a desire to participate in discovery or employment search and VR staff shortages or, or their lack of a system to handle these referrals leads to individuals just giving up on their dreams. Do not forget about our elderly population. Many have retired from work and choose to attend ADT for socialization and life skills experiences. This age group continues to increase. We got a lot of agreements of your statement earlier. Um, yeah. <laughs> we had a lot of people say yes and agree with you. Um, and then um, that we have a, a participant who would like to invite all the panelists to come for a visit to their facility to get a realistic experience of the day in the light of ARC Marion. Um, we will cover it all in the rates, the programs, and the consumers. We can't tell who they are. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, I have an ADT program, and I am in the rural community. I would love to have your problem uh, with the weight with this. I don't. I'm like the young lady that's standing by the wall. Uh, this young lady reached over to me and asked me the question earlier, what would happen if 10 of my people or my consumers uh, receive the job. I will be glad for those 10, but not for my employees or my program, because that would hurt significant. Here's what I think. There are a lot of great ideas in this room, but what seems to come from everyone is the word funding. How do you get funding for these much needed programs? We have to go through the legislature to get state funding. Well, how do we do that? Well, you have to have a sounding voice. And I've said this on several occasions, APD is huge. It goes from South Florida all the way up to North Florida. And someone said a moment ago, what will happen if we all connect and make that voice heard? You see, we don't do that. We are all in our own little corners of the world with the same issues, but we don't have a loud voice. What happens during the legislative period is a group of people who's been coming for years through the disability program come up, roll around, because most are in wheelchairs, and then leave within an hour. So what happens? You get your same funding or less. No real impact. So we do need to organize because funding is an issue. Now, in my humble opinion, the ADT program certainly needs more funding so that we can offer more services. Services. I like what this lady said of all of the entrepreneurship that she's doing. What if we highlight that? Mm -hmm. Because employers are not running through our doors. You still will create employment, but in an area where they can still get money, funds, and continue to be, con uh, well, start being contributing members. But our problem is we're stagnated. We we are divided, we're separated, we're not unified. We don't tell our representatives what we need for them to hear. What if the ADP programs become vocational training? What if we put those what components do? in the ADP program and fund it and start paying them to come and participate, giving incentives? Now, I get in a lot of trouble with ADP because I'm very vocal. I, I say how I, I say what I feel, and I trust God to take care of me. My question here today, and no disrespect, but we're sitting here sharing our issues and our concerns. When we walk out that door, does it elevate or does it die when we walk out that door? I'm concerned about that. Hold on, darling. Hold on. And then I'll be quiet. I must tell you that I am a county commissioner, so I run my mouth. I am concerned 
that this two-hour session is not going to do what we need. I'm concerned that we don't meet enough, we don't network enough, because I want to run over to that young lady in the peach shirt and get her list. It's what I want to do. I want to get her list, and I want to call those people, and I want to get them into a program. Actually, APD should be doing it anyway, so why should they be sitting at home when APD knows that I have 50 slots open? That's my opinion. I think I get in trouble. I get in trouble. No, sir, I don't want to tell you who I am. I mean, that's crazy at this point. We will look you up as a commissioner. Now, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to go up this mic in just a half second, but let me just finish this. The legislative session has just ended. We did not do well. We didn't. When they send us emails out for workshops, just for the Big Ben area, there's almost 300 agencies, just for our area, just for the Northwest. Do you all know there's almost 3,000 agencies of APD, and if we all connect, what a powerful voice that will be in the state of Florida? Do you know how powerful that will be during the legislative sessions? Uh, other than the two or three people or two or three agencies that comes in during the regular session, we have to stop that. They vote significant. So, so our problem is, wait, 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 wait. It's not your time. I'm only having fun. I love you. Our problem is, and I said this to Barbara, and by the way, do you know how many people don't even know who Barbara is in our agency? And this woman is so enlightening. I met her. I love her. I said, you need to carry you out into the community and get these people together. So my point is to you and to the organizer, this thing. When we walk out this door, do we get something as a follow-up? Or are we just a pie in the sky? Do we have an organized plan? Can we meet again yes. so that we can put this thing down in writing? Yes. Can we look for Because right now you didn't get any funding, so you can't do anything at it this year. No, we can't. Not so it's the funding part. But we can do other things to get ready to make the voice of the needed funding clear enough that it can get moved. Let's talk. I, See, it's so much you can do. Like that young I lady right there. I invite you to main, um, be front and center in this solution. This is the day to start creating the solutions together. Um, Kalima and David have heard Mary and I say from the very beginning of working with them um, over the last several months about um, one of the things we have seen from the outside looking in is that clear need for the whole state to be more connected together on creating the solutions, to more clearly having individuals and family voices driving um, what we're doing, and actually putting pen to paper and actually all of you being involved in the creative risk-taking that needs to happen in the state. This afternoon is the beginning of a smaller work group that is a work group, not just a focus group. We're, this is setting the stage for the conversation, um, but now the work begins. Um, it is not about walking away from the room today and having another, you know, us outsiders coming in and telling you what's going on in the nation and what you need to do in Florida. It's time to roll up our sleeves and get some things changed um, at all levels. And I can tell you from my experience over the last 30 plus years in this field that I have learned that um, where the rubber meets the road, the investments we need to put are in the direct support staff and in the listening to individuals, families, and individuals first. Um, we need to get there. Um, they need to know how to do this work. We need to give them the tools um, to do what we're asking them to do and get out of the way. Um, we need to involve the community at large. I've had um, the great opportunity to be involved in what is referred to as community conversations. Anybody know that that terminology or that work? 
it's not work from our system. It's work in the business world. Community conversations are about um, bringing in folks from outside our disability system to help us solve all of this. This is about figuring out how to ask those employers, those local commissioners, um, to be part of what they can personally do to help us make the connections. We have disenfranchised people with disabilities from developing natural relationships that the rest of us do as we go through our life. Um, we need to get back to that place where we do that. I know I, I'm seeing feathered brows um, to, to understand what I'm saying, but this is the first day of getting into rolling up our sleeves, and APD has clearly opened the door wide for all of you to be part of the solution. Um, they know that they can't just make policies and rules or, or platitudes at the state level and make and, and know that it's going to happen in your local communities. You're going to be the ones that make the change, not them. Um, their job is to create the flexibility and the openness and work with the funding that's available, but it's your jobs to make it happen in the field. Go ahead. We have one more in the back that wants to say something. I'm Sue Cabot, and I'm chair of the Florida Developmental Disabilities Council, and I have a 39-year-old who's pretty complex in that he has autism and intellectual disability and bipolar. And um, although money clearly is an issue, um, to move kind of off that, I think there really does have to be a focus on the flexibility and the creativity. But I think that flexibility and creativity uh, don't come easily. I think it requires a lot of brain power and experiences and a willingness to fail, uh, to try things and fail. And I think that, you know, some of the points that were made about having the ability to go back to an ADT if necessary for some retraining or poor times. When I think about Mike and his bipolar, which kind of became the overriding issue for him, he has good days and bad days. And on good days, he could probably do, you know, work on a job site for maybe a couple hours a day. He doesn't have tremendous endurance. But clearly on a bad day, he can't do any work. And he needs a system that's able to provide that flexibility for him so that on days he can be challenged, he's challenged, and on days he can't be challenged, he's not challenged. But I think that, you know, the system we have is very rigid in some ways in terms of what providers are doing and how they're looking at what they're doing and, you know, throw in the little money piece a little bit. Um, because it will be more expensive to have individualized program and individualized supports and, you know, flexibility as opposed to, you know, right now he's in a 1 to 10 ratio. Well, if someone's going to take him out to work, that's going to be 1 to 1 or maybe 1 to 2, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the higher transportation costs and everything else. So I, I just think that if we could – keep in our minds the problem-solving flexibility, um, creativity piece that would really hopefully move us maybe in other directions. Uh, thank you for that. You're exactly right. We do need to think about one person at a time and create the flexibility of the system in a way that addresses what they need on any particular day or where they are in their um, lifespan. So. Do you want to say any final words? We need to start wrapping it up. Um, I do want to appreciate um, or thank all of you and appreciate your comments. Um, we didn't talk about solutions today. It was not the place to, to do that yet. This afternoon we are going to have a smaller group talking about beginning those solutions and putting them in play because we have to do that. We have to do some testing out of what may or may not work and um, how to make it happen. I'm going to come back to Kalima and David. Um, we will bring some tools 
for you here in Georgia. Um, I, Georgia, gosh, where am I? Um, I used to work in Georgia, and as a as a state official in Georgia, I know in that uh, part of Florida where I mean, um, your 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 providers touch Georgia providers. Sorry, uh, senior moment. <laughs> I love Georgia too. It was a good thing. Um, they have their own. Every, every single state in this country has their unique challenges. You have particularly high acute challenges around your funding structure. I'm going to call it funding structure, not just the amount of money. Because I see some ways, or we have uh, Mary and I and some colleagues that have looked at your structures um, in depth, have some ideas about how you can move the infrastructure of your funding. Your voc rehab is starting to do that. APD can do that. Um, it's going to take some hard work. It's going to be working closely with you folks at the Medicaid state agency. It can't just be done by APD. Um, we know that. Um, you're going to have to think about waiver amendments um, and not just Make all the changes when you have a waiver renewal. That's not going to be your best strategy. Um, so we're going to begin the work. We're here to do that. Um, we're here with you for a while. Um, Mary and I come from the National DD Directors Association, and even though our funding to support you right now comes from CMS, we're here beyond that to support you. And stay involved in your lives and um, nudge you along. It is about nudging all of us along. I will challenge us to do that. Um, so I appreciate and hope that you will be at the table at the work group. Um, rural Solutions, I am pointing to you that you didn't announce your name at that I time. <laughs> I, I'm taking you up on that challenge back that this isn't just one conversation today. We're talking about multiple conversations. We need, to, we are going to figure out ways that you folks communicate more regularly. Um, all the different types of modes of communication, be it webinars, be it training, be it just um, linking you together so you learn how to reach each other without being facilitated to do that. So um, I'm going to thank you for coming. Do you want to say anything, David? Uh, I just want to thank everyone again for, for making it out on this was a very short notice uh, for us to get the information out in time to get folks on the webinar. We really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I want to echo what Reese said. I think this is the beginning. We want to continue these conversations. Um, we'll look and see what a, a, a date down the road that we can uh, reconvene a group and be able to share this information and continue this conversation. A special thank you uh, to those of you who shared this information with your networks. Uh, Kirk and Suzanne and Sheila at the FDDC uh, helped me tremendously get this information out because we could not have done it without you. Uh, and then, of course, my co-partner here, Kalima, for helping me pull it all together. Um, we did we did kind of have to do this rushed, so we're hoping that this will continue uh, more planned out in the future um, with that. But uh, thank you, Ree and Mary, for coming down to uh, do this presentation. So look forward to good conversations in the future. Uh, well, Excuse me. Um, I'm one of those people. I'm the policy person. I, although I'm a social worker, I don't tend to do that touchy-feely stuff and, and focus on quality as much. My focus is compliance, uh, predominantly with the CMS final rule. And I'm only here doing this because I, I know it needs to change, and this isn't a one-and-done kind of thing. So I just need everybody in the room, and particularly my unnamed colleague um, who just stepped out. But we're going to have a focus group that consists of a variety, a diverse group of stakeholders this afternoon. And we invite everyone, even those who are not announced to be focus group members, to please attend that and um, because the work is starting and that's going to start at about 1230. Are we pushing that back? Okay. So, yeah, so we, we have an hour break and then we come back and work. And if, if you have to take a little bit longer, do that, but we'll be reconvening back here at 1245. 
same room. <laughs>